friends, my name is Emily and welcome back to my channel. Today I'm going to be doing the third and final April 2020 reading wrap-up. I will leave the other two linked in the cards or in the description box down below. So the first book that I'm going to talk about is Coraline by Neil Gaiman. So this is a piece of horror children's literature. I feel like it's a modern children's classic at this point. This I reread for my In Real Life book club. It was phenomenal. So Coraline is a little girl who has just moved into this big old house with her parents and she's of an age where she still wants to play and wants the attention of her parents but she also wants independence and one day she finds this door into this mirror image world of her house with another mother and another father and these parents are wholly doting on her and it's creepy and uncomfortable and Coraline has to choose between, for me anyway, the story is about Coraline choosing to uh, grow up. It's a coming of age narrative because she has the option to stay with the other mother in this other world and to play all the games, to wear all the costumes, but we see her make choices throughout the text, like to put on the most reserved clothing, to eat the, the nourishing food, to bring an apple with her and, and eat healthy food. I see this as a coming of age novel and it is glorious. I loved the little Zoom call that I had with my In Real Life book club. It was really nice to read a piece of children's literature and just something light and fluffy and, well, for me this is light and fluffy. Uh, everyone else found it kind of disturbing and horrific. I, I don't know if there's something wrong with me. I've been desensitized. I didn't find this horrific. It was just perfectly creepy and it was a, such fun. It was fun for me to reread this. So, like I said, this was a reread and I gave this five out of five stars, or rather, should I say, I maintained my five out of five star rating for this book. The next book that I finished was Big Magic, Creative Living Beyond Fear by Elizabeth Gilbert. Elizabeth Gilbert of Eat, Pray, Love fame. So this is a book that's all about creativity and taking chances and doing the thing that you want to do, not because you think it will make you money, but because like you cannot live without doing it. I think what I enjoyed the most about this book was hearing about somebody else's creative process. And there was definite value to just getting another perspective on creativity and like this creative drive energy that goes into making art. However, I struggle with things that are too hippy-dippy, shall I say. I didn't think I was this person until I started reading self-help books, but there are certain things that just make me cringe. They feel really uh, preachy and uncomfortable when they happen, and self-help books tend to do this a lot. So this came from my TBR and I did end up giving this three out of five stars because I could see the value in parts of this book in that it's really interesting to see somebody else's creative process, but as an overall experience the cringe makes me hesitant to like return back to this for advice uh, in a way that something like Amanda Palmer's The Art of Asking is also about creativity and the creative process and valuing your art and your labor that goes into your art, and I would return back to her work. So the next book I read was Dumplin by Julie Murphy. So I had read Dear Sweet Pea earlier in the month, which was middle grade. I could see it being a great Disney property, and it turns out Disney has its sticky little fingers on it already, called that the right market, the right voice. And I didn't super enjoy Sweet Pea because I thought the child narrative voice was a little too accurate for me to enjoy the book. So I decided to go and pick up the other Julie Murphy off my TBR shelf, which was Dumpling. This is YA, so a slightly older voice. Dumpling is the story of a self-proclaimed fat girl who loves her body, has a really intimate relationship with her aunt, but not her mother. And so her aunt lived with them, they were very close, and her aunt was sort of this buffer between her and her mother. Her mother is a formerly fat girl, dieted down to stereotypical 
beauty standards. Former winner of this Miss Teen Blue Bonnet beauty pageant and um, so the aunt was Willow Dean's like safety net, um, like a, a positive force that was like, hey, you're a good human, you're a beautiful human, your body deserves to take up all the space and exist in its natural form. You don't have to be like your mother and eat shredded lettuce for months on end to meet this impossible standard that like even she can't uphold naturally. And I focus more on that, that struggle, that family relationship, because I feel like the Netflix adaptation, which I had watched previous to this, really sucks out some of the uh, nuance there. I mean, obviously it has to make an adaptation it has to be shorter. But I think what really stands out about the book is the the complexities around Willow Dean's relationship to her body and her family and the people in her life. Whereas the film was very much about like anybody is a pageant body, anybody is a beauty queen. It's not about how your body looks, it's about how you act with that body, which is still a great message. Now I did give it four out of five stars because I feel like a five out of five star book for me is something that I itch to reread the moment I close it. And I feel like while I will definitely reread Dumplin' at some point in my life, it's not something that I itch to reread in the same way that like I would be so tempted to turn around and reread Coraline the minute I finished it. So the next thing that I read was book two of the stand, which is like the meatiest part of the stand, and it dragged. It is as bloated as the corpses from the beginning of the novel. That's maybe harsh. <laughs> In the live show with my patrons, I agreed that maybe expansive was the more uh, pleasant and uh, diplomatic way to describe this middle section. I super struggled. So the middle chunk of this book is really picking up. So the stand is about uh, a plague, a plague that hits the world, um, knocking out like 99.5% of the population or something ridiculous like that. And the middle chunk of the book is about the rebound right? There's a rebound from the plague. And unfortunately, we get to see like the nitty gritty details and it answers all of the questions, which is something that people often point out in like shows like The Walking Dead. They're like, who's mowing the lawn? The stand answers that question for you. They tell you who's doing body cleanup and they describe it. They tell you how the new government is going to be organized and they show you like motion. I second the motion. Everybody yay, everybody nay, motion passed. Moving on to the next item on our agenda. And you just, at least I, want to die. Uh, if I didn't have the live show that I, like, I had to have notes for, I had to have this read for, I would not have made it through this section of the book. And the stupid thing is that nothing changed. Nothing about this section changed for me. From my first read to my second read to like as I sit here now, I still have all of the same critiques as I did before. However, I now have warm fuzzy memories attached to it because I had a really great live show with my patrons and like we talked a lot about the characters and the dynamics and what was happening and like the dark Christian themes that are running through here. Objectively nothing has changed and yet I have warmer feelings towards the text. This is the weirdest experience. I don't even know how I'm gonna rate this book in the end because like objectively all of my critiques are still true. We'll see how I come out of this. Uh, then I read Like a Love Story by Adib Naziman. Sorry for the mispronunciation there. So this is the story of queer teens in the time of AIDS, like in the late 80s. Reza is a teen from Iran. He has recently moved from Iran to Toronto and then from Toronto to New York and he knows that he's gay and in the airport he has picked up a magazine and learned about AIDS, this gay plague, and he is so scared of getting AIDS. I mean understandably because it's the like late 80s, early 90s and it doesn't look good for folks who are uh, diagnosed with AIDS. He ends up meeting Judy, who is a plus-sized, 
fashion aspiring girl whose uncle is gay and is dying of AIDS and like she is super involved in the queer community in New York. She's seeing a lot of things firsthand. And then her best friend Art is a gay privileged boy whose parents do not approve of his sexuality, of him being out. They are very embarrassed by him being out as gay and trying to do activism, trying to do art. He's a photographer. He's taking pictures of really important moments for the queer community in New York at this time. He's participating in public protests about AIDS and how it's being treated or not treated. Reza meets them, has a crush on Art, but ends up dating Judy because he doesn't want to get AIDS. It, it's it's a whole thing. It's a perspective that I haven't seen in YA before. When I talked about HIV and werewolfism for Lumos, I asked if there were any books that dealt with AIDS. I haven't had time to go back to the comments yet, but I feel like when I they came in on my phone, I feel like somebody recommended this. I realized that I actually had it on my shelf. It was so good. I feel like a lot of queer YA now is very rooted in the present, which makes sense because it's for teens who are living in the present, but I think the queer history from the like contemporary perspective is important, especially because there is a whole generation of queer men that are gone. And so there's a huge chunk of queer history that is gone. Um, it's something that comes up a lot in queer lit classes and queer film classes. Queer produced films were documenting activists at that time. Like they were, they were casting folks from the community who were HIV positive, who had AIDS, and like that is, that is their snapshot. I'm thinking specifically of the, I believe it's Canadian produced AIDS musical Zero Patients, which used a lot of the queer activists in Toronto at the time, and like many of those people passed away during the production of the film due to AIDS. There is a just fabulous number by a queer individual who was sick on the day that they had the original song programmed or scheduled and they had to reschedule it and then they 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 bolstered themselves they felt a little bit better they came back they sang their number and then they died uh not so long after that um and so a lot of this uh queer media from the late 80s early 90s is super important um and i feel like are things that young people now need as part of their history, and I really, really appreciate this. I gave Like a Love Story five out of five stars. It did come from my TBR, and like, if you haven't read it, put it on your library holds list. It's so good. Then I decided I needed something fun, <laughs> and so I read Alana the First Adventure by Tamara Pierce. This is a childhood favorite. It gives me all the warm fuzzies. This is the story of Alana of Trebond who switches places with her twin brother and masquerades as a boy. She goes off to the palace to learn to become a knight in a time when women are not allowed to become warriors. And it follows the first four years of her page training. And it's also sort of her learning about her magic. She's never liked her gift, but she is forced to use it throughout this text and becomes a lot more comfortable with it. It's just a fun, warm, fuzzy read. I gave this a five out of five stars still. This was a reread, obviously. The last book that I read in April is actually a novella. It is Silver in the Wood by Emily Tesh. Here's the danger. This is a new buy, obviously. I was scrolling through Instagram and Tor had published this post that was about all of their like award-winning or award-considered uh, fiction. I saw the photo for this and was like, that there's a man made of trees. All right, I'm in. I have a weird 
interest in the forests that are sort of creepy and alive, and I definitely got that with this. So this is the story of Tobias, who is this wild man who lives in this wild magical woods, and he's sort of protecting the villagers from angry forest spirits, and he, he's taking care of the woods, and he sort of lives there out of time, out of space. You're unsure if he's sort of a supernatural figure or a human, like what his role is, it's a mystery. And then this overly enthusiastic folklorist and the technical like landowner of the forest that Tobias lives in shows up and is like, hey, I'm doing some research on this things, on the history of the forest, herp to derp. Things sort of go from there and like very early on, you're like, gay lumberjacks? Some gay woodsmen? some gay, gay forest, and yes, yes, you do get some gay lumberjack vibes, I, which I loved. I, <laughs> I loved, obviously. The one thing that I will say is that because there are so many men in this and things are sort of happening quickly because it is a novella, it's very uh, short and concise, there are moments where instead of using a name, a pronoun is used and you're like, okay, he did this to him. And you're like, which he did what to who? Like, the, there's too many hymns as options, and this is confusing. And, and I feel like we use pronouns because repeating the person's name over and over again, like, Tobias did this to Silver, Silver said this to Tobias, gets clunky, but if you're going through something fairly quickly and it's like fluid, if it's a little bit mysterious and a little bit um, magical and whimsical, then having unspecific pronouns means that I found myself frequently being like, he did this to him. And I was like, what? Who did? What? And I'd have to go back and read the paragraph before very carefully to see who was the actor of the verb, or who was the most likely actor of the verb to like make the, the, the sentence make sense. Hopefully I'm making sense there. It was just in places, the writing that was otherwise like really great at describing this magical forest with these these dryads um, and, and tree spirits and mythology of like the green man in the woods, like the language around the folklore was beautiful. And then in other places, it was so confusing. I wrestled with the star decision on this. I could definitely see myself rereading this, and I think with more rereadings, those confusion moments will be resolved because I will know the plot, I will have the plot down pat. And I loved the myth vibes and the forest vibes in this so much that I think it's worth it to pursue the sort of clunky writing in places. So I ended up giving this four to five stars because it ticks a lot of my boxes for what I'm interested in. I definitely can see myself rereading this enough. Was that the only new buy in April? Nice! I only had one other new buy in April and it was Howl's Moving Castle from my first uh, reading wrap up and that was for book club. I am doing very good at tackling my TBR, I feel. Let me know your thoughts on these books in the comments down below. I'm hoping to get to the comments very soon and sort of like spend a day just engaged in everything that you've said. Before we go, we have to thank my patrons. Thank you patrons for making videos like this and long-form projects like Lumos possible. I really appreciate the work that you are enabling me to do. If you're interested in becoming a patron and supporting the channel, links to the Patreon page are in the description box down below. I will also leave a link to every single one of the books that I talked about today in the description box. The links are book depository affiliate links, so if you are interested in purchasing anything, I do get a very small commission for diverting the sales to book depository. I hope you all are doing well, and I will see you soon. Bye. Bye.